And um, anyway, my name is Dave Unger, but that's not important. The most important name to know when you leave here is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. And we are going to look at Satan's CIA. You know, we have a CIA here on planet Earth, Central Intelligence Agency. Well, God's got one too in heaven, and his a celestial invisible agents referred to as angels, and Satan also has one that I like to call <clears throat> celestial infernal agents who are about his business to stop and hinder the work of God to the best of his ability. And so we want to look at Satan and learn his strategies, his schemes, his plots, be able to see his fingerprints and to not be ignorant of his devices, as Paul said in the scripture. God doesn't want us to be ignorant of our enemy. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, we're going to read there in 1 Peter chapter number 5 and verse number 8. If you're able to stand, I want you to stand to honor the reading of the Word of God. And if you can't stand, don't worry. No one's going to think anything different of you. But the Bible says... In 1 Peter chapter 5, let's go to verse 6 and start there. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, and strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's go Amen. to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this time that you've given to us. And Lord, now I pray with all my heart that you would touch me, anoint me, and help me to bring your word, Lord, with the ability that only you can provide. Lord, you very clearly tell us in the Scripture that it's your spirit that quickens, but Lord, the flesh profits nothing. So Father, I pray with all my heart that you'll take away the deadness and the dullness that the flesh brings. I pray, Father, with all my heart that you'll let your word go forth in power. You'd open up every heart and mind to receive and understand your word. And that, Lord, you would protect us from the enemy and help us not to be ignorant of who he is. And, Lord, help us to truly focus on you and, Lord, lift you up and praise you for the fact that, Lord, you are our great shepherd that protects us from the evil one. Lord, I just pray also for anyone that's in this room that may be lost, that does not know you as Lord and Savior. There's never been a time in their life, Lord, where they have truly acknowledged that they're a sinner, Lord, towards you. And you tell us in your word, for all have sinned and fallen short of your standard and that the wages of sin is death and hell forever but the free gift of god is eternal life through christ jesus our lord lord i just pray with all my heart that you'll give them the faith to understand that they're a sinner to understand that your son jesus went to the cross and paid in full every single sin they have or ever would commit and that lord you tell us in peter that you bore our sin in your body died in our place received all the wrath of god for it. And Lord, we just praise you for being the wrath bearer and our sin bearer. Lord, I just pray you give them the faith to believe that you shed your blood. And Lord, you tell us in your word without the shedding of your blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And that you give them the faith to believe that you died and that you were buried. And that Lord, you give them the faith to believe that you, God, raised Jesus from the dead. And Lord, you tell us in Romans chapter 10 that if anyone calls upon your name, Lord, with a heart that's willing to repent of self and sin, that, Lord, all those that call upon your name shall be saved. So, Lord, if there's one here that's lost tonight, I pray that you'll save their soul. Grant them eternal forgiveness. Lord, as you tell us in your word, it's your will that none should perish, that none should go to hell, but that all should come to repentance. Lord, we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen. I was reminded of a story I heard of a gentleman that died, and he went to heaven, and he met, of course, St. Peter at the gate, right? It's always St. Peter at the gate, right? And he said, you know, I'm going to the book, and I really can't see that you did a lot wrong, and you didn't do a lot good. He says, I'll tell you what, you have to have 100 points to get into heaven. If you can tell me some things that you did, and you add up to 100 points, I'll let you into heaven. So the guy said, well, I was married to my wife. I was faithful to her uh, for 50 years, also in my heart, never sinned against her. And he said, well, that's worth one point. He said, one point? 
<laughs> he's like, what? One point? He said, well, you know, I started a, a, a kitchen out of our church, and I helped feed the homeless and did those kind of things. He's like, well, that's worth two points. He said, two points? He said, man, at this rate, man, it's only going to be by the grace of God that I get into heaven. And Peter said, you're in. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yes, indeed. Boy, oh, boy. Well, we're going to spend a little while looking at our number one arch enemy, the hitman from hell. His name is Satan. He is the mob boss of all mob bosses. And we are going to look at his strategies and his schemes and who he is and how he works and how he functions to help better prepare us as Christians to know when the enemy is in our, in our presence, when the enemy is trying to work in and through people that may be around us that don't know the Lord, how he tries to hinder the work of God and the gospel of God. So we want to look at Satan and his CIA, his central infernal agents, if you will. And Satan is a very organized being. And we'll see that as we study him for the next few weeks. You know, but I ask myself, what is the best way that one can know what demons do and how they operate? And it came to me that the best way to really know how they operate is by looking at the chief demon himself, whose name is Satan. That infernal majesty, that director, the organizer of what the Bible calls all the fallen angels that followed him. So in looking at Satan, we're going to inevitably learn that all demons are alike. Satan desires to be worshipped. That was his sin of pride, according to Ezekiel. The Bible says, because of the brightness of your beauty, you were corrupted. So basically, the Word of God tells us that Satan was made so magnificent that he fell in love with himself, got to looking in the mirror, and then he said in Isaiah, the five I wills in Isaiah 14, I will ascend my throne above the stars. And then ultimately he says, I will be like the most high, and God kicks Satan out of heaven. Are you with me? Now, sometimes there's a real danger in studying Satan. What do you mean? Well, in fact, there's basically two dangers that we have to be aware of before we dive in and look at this culprit, God's arch enemy, the devil. Now, as Christians, some people don't take Satan seriously enough. That's the first problem. People don't take him as serious as he needs to be taken. They envision him all bound up in a big chain. Some Christians believe that they can just simply speak a few words like, I bind you, Satan. And then somehow, someway, there's a big chain put on Satan, and boy, the devil's taken care of. Well... If Satan is on a chain or on a leash, it's an awful long one because he is still in the business of killing, stealing, and destroying, and we see that every day going on on this planet. Amen? Amen. You see, it's going to take more than just saying, I bind you, Satan, because the Word of God says here in Peter that we're to submit ourselves to God. We're to resist the devil. How? By being obedient to the Lord, by staying in prayer by casting our cares and our burdens upon him and trusting and relying on the shepherd to take care of that wolf. Amen? You know as well as I do that as a shepherd is watching his sheep, if a wolf comes, sheep are absolutely defenseless when it comes to defending themselves against a wolf. Amen? There's nothing they can do. God calls us sheep. There is nothing that we can do against our arch enemy, Satan, who is, man, the Bible says was made... Full of wisdom. Boy, we're going to look at his character and, and how smart he really is. But yet he uses it for evil purposes now. So, our great shepherd, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Amen? Amen. So, we have to depend on and rely on the Lord to take care of the devil in our life. Now, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes that if you run through a hedge and you do it without looking, a serpent may bite you. There might be a snake in there. Well, that gives us a picture of God's laws, God's loving limits in our life. As long as we're being obedient to the Lord, we are protected by his laws. You know, the Bible says, especially to young people, you know, don't fornicate. Wait till you're married before you have intimate relations with the one that you're with because all other sexual activity is sin in the eyes of God. So when people don't listen to that law, that loving limit, they go out and get diseases and everything else because they don't submit themselves to the Word of God. Amen? Now that doesn't mean that you're not going to have a difficult time at being obedient to God because we certainly will. 
but God protects us from the evil one. Amen? Amen. Now, <clears throat> there's a tendency to de-emphasize uh, Satan. There's people that think he's running around with a pitchfork, that he's red and he's stabbing people. You know, that's all cartoony kind of stuff. Satan loves that when people think of him <laughs> like that. They don't take him serious enough. You see, some Christians, if they're not careful, the second danger is, is that they will make Satan out to be something that he's not. They, some people, lost people, deify him. Some Christians make him out to be more scary than he really is. Now, he's a scary opponent, but some Christians get paralyzed with fear because they focus on him so much they forget to focus on the Lord when they study Satan. You see, when it comes to angels, when it comes to the spiritual world, there's a natural curiosity. Amen? I don't know about you, but I'm terrified of snakes. I held one the other day. I told my wife to hurry up and take a picture, and I gave it back. Amen? <laughs> I did, I did. Boy, I did. I couldn't believe I was doing it, because this guy challenged me in front of my wife and my kids, so what was it, what's the guy to do, right? <laughs> Boy, man, oh, man. But I remember, though, as terrified as I am of snakes, there's something that draws me to that glass. Well, I want to look in that glass and see, see what they look like. Amen? Well, the problem with the spiritual world is there's no glass. Amen? So we have to be careful. We have to go about this with a balance and not to focus on him and get paralyzed with fear. You see, the unknown or that which is mysterious. Boy, you know, the old saying, curiosity killed the cat. Well, Satan loves it when people take him as being a very serious opponent or making him more than he really is. But he also loves it when people don't take him serious enough. So we need the balance between those two. Amen? And we must realize and understand, according to the Word of God, that yes, he's a formidable foe, but at the same time, he's a defeated foe. Amen? Jesus Christ defanged Satan at Calvary's cross. Now, he can bark real loud, and he's able to do certain things, but if you're born again and you're a Christian, he can never have your soul. Amen? Sin will not claim it because you've been saved. You've been forgiven. And once you're truly saved, you're saved forever. Jesus said in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. Therefore, we can boldly say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, I was in the Air Force for eight years, and we used to go have these mock exercises where we played war, and you had to wear these vests, and, man, they had guns, they had laser beams, and if your, if your uh, jacket went off, it would sound an alarm if you got hit. Well, all the people that got hit had to do KP duty. Well, that was fun. So that was incentive to stay alive, amen? But some of the people were assigned to study the, our opponent their tactics, their abilities, their habits, and so on. And then when they would learn about the enemy, they would feed that in information to headquarters, and then headquarters would take that information and then begin to uh, direct it towards the troops that were out in the field. Well, we need to get our information from the headquarters of heaven itself concerning our arch enemy, Satan. Amen? So that's what we want to do. Paul said, you know, I wanted to come to you, but Satan opposed us. We have an enemy that absolutely is going to oppose you and oppose me because he hates God, therefore he hates you. So we want to answer some questions. Does Satan really exist? Who is Satan? What is he like? What does he do? How does he operate? Well, first of all, let's look at a secular perspective of Satan. You know, we conclude... Just, just from a secular standpoint, if people want to be really honest and be real, we conclude that there must be a real devil or an opponent because of the opposites that we see that go on on this planet. Are you with me? We can see uh, absolute harmony does not exist. There's light and there's darkness. Amen? There's wisdom and there's stupidity. So there's two opposites, two opposing forces. There's happiness and sorrow. There's kindness and cruelty. There's fulfillment and there's also failure. There's strength and weakness. There's health and, and disease. There's life and death. There's sin. And there's also righteousness. Amen? And so there's an opposing force of good and evil going on. I like what John MacArthur said about Satan and about these two opposing forces. This is what he said, and I quote John MacArthur. The very fact 
that there are these tragedies exist not contra is, are, are not contradicting proof that a good and living God is responsible for them, but rather evidence that some other personal being is actively engaged in trying to stifle the plan of God. Can the same being create something good and also something evil that works against his efforts? That's like the old question, can God make a rock so big that he can't lift it? It doesn't make any sense. Amen? End quote. You see, number one, God doesn't create evil because the word of God is very clear in 1 John that there is no unrighteousness in him. It literally means not even the smallest particle that can even be cut in two. There is no darkness. There is no sin. There is no evil in the Lord. He is not the author of it. Now, evil exists because of mankind, because of Satan in the fall. Amen? So we're responsible for our sin. But God gets blamed for a lot of things that he doesn't need to get blamed for. Because there is a real devil who has rebellious actions, who's rebelled from the beginning. Now, while Satan's over there in the corner smiling and has that sneer on his face, because God does get a lot of things laid at his feet that he shouldn't be blamed for by a lot of people. So does Satan exist? Yes, he does. Now let's look at a spiritual perspective, a biblical perspective, to see or whether or not he exists. Well, let's look at what the saints of God say according to the scripture. Well, Peter said in 1 Peter 5, 8, our chapter, let's read it again. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You know, one thing about lions I've learned that sometimes they'll roar. And typically they roar when they kill something, as a victory roar. But sometimes the lions learn to roar, and when a lion roars the way they do, sometimes all the animals let their guard down because those animals think, hey, he's got his meal for today, and I'm not going to be it. When really, he didn't. So now their guard's down, and boy, that's when he's looking. He's looking for those animals that are out there on the on the periphery, or those that get away from the herd or the pack. Those are the ones that lions go after. So Peter says, hey, he's real. Be sober. Be vigilant. Pay attention. Wake up. You know, another thing about the animal kingdom, Satan's referred to as a serpent. One thing that I've noticed about all snakes is that they don't have eyelids. Their eyes are always open. They're predators, man. Amen. They don't have eyelids. So, man, Satan doesn't blink, if you will. And he's always looking. In fact, when the devil was tempting Jesus after the temptation was over. The Bible says the devil, the devil left. Well, in the Greek, that word left doesn't mean that he left completely. In the Greek, it literally means he took a few steps back and said, okay, I'm going to leave Jesus alone, but I'm just going to watch from a distance. So he didn't leave. He was looking for another opportunity to get into his life, to mess with him, to tempt him, to get him to trip up. Boy, John says in 1 John 3, 8, he that practices sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. John also believed in Satan. So to say that you believe in Jesus Christ, but not the devil, is to make a mockery out of what Christ is doing and what Christ did and who Christ is. You see, you have to believe in both or you can't understand the conflict that exists on this planet, nor can you understand the conflict that exists Within the scripture itself. Amen? Amen. John tells us what that conflict is. 1 John 5, 19. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Little G. Little God. James says of the devil in James chapter 4, verse 7. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Maybe you experienced this. You've been on I-75 or some freeway. And then you got some guy behind you that boy's in a rush. You ever had that? And you know that they're in a rush, right? So what people have a tendency to do is what? When they got somebody behind them that they know wants to go. It has a tendency to speed you up, does it not? And then before you know it, you're speeding, doing uh, something that you shouldn't be doing. And boy, now you're in trouble. But I've learned, one time I said, yeah, I'm not budging one mile. Boy, you can go around me whenever you get the chance. And sure enough, after a while, boy, he left. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. He'll go find somebody else to mess with. Amen? That's why it all goes back to our obedience to the Lord. Our obedience to the scripture. Paul said in Ephesians 2.2 2, that all men were victimized by the spirit that now worketh in the sons of disobedience. 
Do you realize that God categorizes all the people on this planet, all seven billion of them, that you're either a child of God or you're a child of the devil? Wow. God, the saints believe and know that the Satan is real. In Matthew chapter 4, we see Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. It says that Jesus was hungry, and the devil said this, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones that they be made bread. Now, in the Greek, guys, in the English, it almost comes across as if there's a question mark. If you're the Son of God, then do this. But in the Greek, it literally is this. In lieu of the very fact that I say to know you are the Son of God, command these stones that they be made, made bread. So, Satan tempted the Lord. Amen? And the Bible says that God cannot be tempted with sin. But he was tempted in all points as we were, yet without sin. Praise the Lord. Amen? Now, here in Scripture, we see Jesus having a personal conversation with a real devil. Amen? So there's absolutely no question that our Savior... Uh, knew the reality of Satan. So again, to say that Jesus was not talking to a real devil was to say that Jesus was crazy and talking to somebody that wasn't there. And we know that that's absolutely not true. Amen? In John chapter 12, verse 31, Jesus said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world, Satan, be cast out. So there's a judgment day coming for Satan. Jesus looked at the Pharisees in John chapter 8, verse 44, and said to them, You are of your father, the devil. So Jesus testifies to us, the saints of God testify to us, that man, Satan is real. But also, not only the saints and our Savior testify to that fact, but also the schemes of Satan testify to the fact that the devil is real. Now guys, I would assume as a preacher and a pastor here at this church that everybody believes in a real devil. So I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but at the same time, as a pastor, you just don't know who's out there in the congregation either. So they need to understand that Satan is real, Jesus is real, the Word of God is the Bible. Amen? Amen. Now, we know that on crime scenes... We've seen those CSI movies where they go and they investigate murders and all the things that took place. Now, the murderer is long gone. We don't know where he's at, but they're on his trail. Amen? So what do they do? They search for the evidence. They look at different things. They have different tools to be able to do that. Well, we also can look at Satan's fingerprints at all of his crime scenes as well by looking at his actions. He speaks words sometimes that are thrilling, but in his actions we see him killing, destroying, and stealing everything that is good. Amen? Now his schemes or his actions speak and testify to the fact that he exists. Now, first of all, let's look at some of them. His dastardly deeds, if you will. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 and 6, we see that he is tempting Eve. Did you notice that he went after Eve? Because Satan knew that God directly spoke to Adam. That's why Adam was held accountable for all mankind's sin. The Bible says that sin passed from Adam to every single person there was. Now, even though Eve sinned, God charged Adam and all of mankind through Adam. Why? Because God directly, from his mouth to Adam, said, You can eat of all the trees in the garden except for the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Remember that? Well, Eve didn't get directly spoke to by the Lord. It was her husband's job to teach Eve, and so he told her, and as the devil's tempting her, what did she say? Well, we can eat of all the trees in the garden, except for the one that's in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Neither shall you touch it. Well, God didn't say that they couldn't touch it. So Satan knew that Eve was messed up in her teaching, and she got it wrong. So rather than saying, you know what, devil? Let me go talk to my husband because God directly told him, let me see what he said. Make sure, make sure I got it right. Well, she didn't do that. So we see that Satan is the tempter. Listen, if Jesus tempted Adam and Eve in paradise, don't think for a second that he's not going to tempt you in a fallen world that's not paradise. Amen? If he tempted the master of heaven, our Lord and Savior, while he was in the flesh, and he wasn't afraid to do that. Don't think for a second he's not afraid to tempt you. Amen? He's the master fisherman as well. Jesus fishes for men, so does Satan. You know, 
when you see a business, sometimes you go to these older towns, you'll see a sign that says been in business for 50 years, 75 years. You know why they do that? To establish credibility. We're not a fly-by-night town. Well, if Satan had a sign, his sign would say been in business for almost 6,000 years. He knows how to fish for the souls of men. Amen? Boy, he does. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 and 11, we see him tempting Jesus Christ, so he's still at it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 14, the Bible says, He deceives individuals because he presents himself as an angel of light. And the Bible goes on to say, And therefore it's no big thing, or it's no wonder that his servants disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness either. So Satan has his preacher boys just like God has his, according to the word of God. So he disguises himself as an angel of light. In 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 6 and 7, Revelation chapter 16, verse 14, and Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 8, the Bible says he deceives the nations. So he's organized. He not only deceives the individual, but his whole goal is also to deceive every nation. Listen, Satan's goal is to get people to put their faith or trust in whatever you want to call it out there, except for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And he does a great job at doing it, unfortunately. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 19, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, he hinders the gospel. Let me tell you honestly, every time I've ever been in church and I've seen real trouble start, it always starts when, man, people really begin to put the pedal to the metal and sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Satan would say, hey, you teaching Greek and Hebrew? Great. Awesome. Hey, you're doing this, you're doing that? Okay, okay. Hey, but don't tell people about the gospel. Boy, that's where he really fights. That's where he really, that's the thorn in his side. Calvary's cross, amen? That's the only stick that will lick Satan, amen? Amen. Boy, and praise God for our Savior that did. First Thessalonians chapter 2, he hinders his servants. Paul said, I wanted to come to you, I wanted to come to you, but Satan opposed us. So Satan in that case literally got the job done and kept Paul from getting to where he wanted to go. Boy. In, Zach- Zach- in Zechariah, the Bible says he opposes the work of God. In Luke chapter 4, verse 9 through 12, he perverts God's word. He also perverted God's word in the garden because he said, didn't God say? Did God say? You see, Satan will always put a question mark where God puts a period. Amen? Did God say that? Did you notice how Satan said, did God say that you couldn't eat of any tree of the garden? Well, Satan knew what God said. He said that they could eat of every tree except for one. But he starts the question out by watering it down, by adding to the scripture. Did God say that you couldn't eat of any tree of the garden? You see, what Satan does is he first gets people doubting. Did God say, did he really say that? You know, if you look at Harvard, you look at Princeton University, those two universities used to be the hotbed of Bible conservative preaching. Revivals have come out of those schools. And now when you look at those schools, they're a cesspool of liberalism. Why? Because they begin to doubt and question God's word. Is God's word really God's word? And then what Satan does, he adds and takes away to it. So then they dilute the word of God. Dilute, dilute, dilute. And then what does Satan do? He told Adam, hey, God does it in the day that you eat of it. And your, your, your mind's going to be open, and you'll know good from evil. But what did God say? God said, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Is that when you read through the genealogies, the Bible says, and Adam and Eve died. So somebody was lying, amen? And it wasn't God, it was Satan. So, doubt, 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 dilute, dilute, dilute. And then he comes in and denies. You can see that pattern all throughout all kinds of different denominations. You realize that Southern Baptist, our church is Southern Baptist, that it's the only denomination in world history, in world history, that started going to the left and came back to the right, back to the fact that the scripture is inerrant, it's infallible, it's the eternal, indestructible, eternal word of God. Amen? Amen. But when most denominations and all denominations that get away from the Bible and begin to question its, 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 its authority... And it's genuineness, all those denominations go left and they stay left and they just keep going that direction. Boy, so praise God for the revival that he gave Southern Baptists. Amen? Amen. Boy, oh boy, he perverts God's word. In Jude, 
verse 1 9 he contends with the archangel Michael over the body of Moses now the Bible doesn't say why but most scholars believe he was contending over the body of Moses why because the Bible says that God himself buried Moses he didn't let man bury Moses God buried Moses why most scholars believe because if they could find out where he was buried they would set up a monument and begin to worship Moses rather than the Lord and Satan wanted his body in Job chapter 1 verse 6 he appears before God in 1st Peter chapter 5 verse 8 looking at his dastardly deeds he walks about like a roaring lion in Revelation chapter 12 verse 10 he's the accuser night and day of the brethren boy Lord did you see that calls himself a Christian Look at what he's doing. And praise God, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, that we have an advocate with the Father who's a propitiation for our sins, not only for our sins, but for the world. Jesus Christ is our advocate. Amen? Amen. Who always lives to make intercession for us, the Bible says. But he's an accuser of the brethren. In Hebrews chapter 12, or chapter 2, verse 14, the Bible says that he had the power of death. But praise God, Revelation chapter 1, verse Number eight says that Jesus Christ now holds the keys of death and hell in his hand. Amen. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 13 to 24, he initiated the entrance of sin into this world. So it's absolutely undeniable fact that Satan exists and is alive and well, and he's very busy at stealing, killing, and destroying today. Amen. Amen. Boy, he's always oppressing the work of God. He's opposing the word of God. He's oppressing Christians and he's possessing those that are lost. He is busy. So if someone you know does denies the existence of the devil, then they're also denying the existence of Jesus Christ himself. They're calling God a liar, making a mockery of the work of Christ and the words of Christ. Boy. Now, the saints knew he existed. The Savior knows he exists. The schemes of the devil or Satan show that he exists. And the scriptures tell us that he exists. So let's answer that question. Does Satan exist? Yes, yes he does. He exists. Yes, a million times, yes. Now what is he? What is the devil exactly? Well, Ezekiel 28, verses 11 through 19 tells us that Satan is a cherubim angel. Now you can study about cherubim angels. They have two wings. They have the face of a man in some cases. And... They seem to be angels that guard because it was the two cherubim that were on the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, where God dwelt in the tabernacle. Also, it was a cherubim angel that God sent to the Garden of Eden after they sinned. And the Bible says that God sent a cherubim angel with a flaming sword to guard the way of the tree of life. Least they, Adam and Eve, reach out and take of the fruit and live forever in a sinful state. So that angel was sent there to slay them so that they could not reach out and touch, take, take of the tree of life. See, most people forget about that tree, but that tree also was in the garden. So it shows God's intent. That God's not a bully. God doesn't force people to love him. Amen. You have to choose him. You have to repent of sin and trust him to be saved now. Amen. Yeah. Satan is a cherubim. And in fact, the Bible says that he was an anointed angel. It's the only angel in all the Bible that the Word of God says was anointed. Now, there may be more. We don't know. But we do know that he's the only one mentioned in the Scripture that was the anointed angel of God. He was made perfect in wisdom and full of beauty. Or perfect in beauty. That word literally means that he was this man, the absolute apex of beauty. So to see Satan, no wonder why they called him Lucifer, the shining one, before he fell. Boy. He was the shining one who is now the dim one. He was the brightest one, but now he's the darkest one because of sin. Now, but somewhere between his creation and Genesis chapter 3, something terrible happened. Lucifer took some of the angels with him in a rebellion. Jesus said in Matthew 25, verse 41, the Lord speaks of the devil and of his angels. He prepared hell for the devil and his angels. So hell was not prepared for us originally. It was prepared for Satan and his angels. Now, how many angels did Satan take with him when he fell from heaven? Anybody know? One third. A third. And we know that because Revelation chapter 12 tells us that Satan the dragon and his tail drew a third part of the stars, and that's referred to as being angels of heaven, and uh, he 
brought them to earth. So, a side note, looking at a third of the angels, that means there's two holy angels for every unholy angel. God's not outnumbered. Amen? Praise the Lord. Absolutely. Now, there are two different types of fallen angels or demons. Those that are loose, they're not bound. They, uh, the Bible says uh, the second heavenlies is where they dwell and also here on earth. But you also have angels, according to the word of God, that are bound because of what they did in Genesis chapter 6. Now, guys, I can't really get into that study, but if you want to ask me more questions about it, I will. But Genesis chapter 6 says that the sons of God, angels, came down, and they had relations with women, and their offspring were the giants, Nephilim. And that word Nephilim means the fallen ones. And these were the men of mighty renown. Have you ever noticed in the Bible that God wanted all the giants wiped out? He wanted them all killed? The Bible says that that took place before the flood and also after the flood. So it was almost as if Satan knew because of what was given to him in Genesis chapter 3 by God. Hey, he said, this woman's seed, referring to Jesus Christ according to the book of Galatians, he will bruise your head, but you're going to bruise his heel, speaking of Calvary's cross. But Satan's head was crushed on Calvary's cross, and he knew that it was going to be the offspring of a woman that was going to do it. So it was almost as if Satan wanted to pollute the bloodline. Now, some people say, well, you know, Seth was the godly line, Cain was the ungodly line, but listen, Seth's line and Cain's line all died in the flood equally. So that just shows you that there wasn't some godly line that these giants came from. <clears throat> The Bible says in Job, the morning stars sang together when God was creating this planet. That's how we know that angels were created before this world began. Before the world began, God created angels, and the Bible says they were there to see the awesome power of God speaking this world, this universe, into existence from absolutely nothing. And the Bible says they shouted out for joy at the power, the sheer power, the awesome power of God. And that same Three words there are the same words that are used in Genesis chapter number 6. And the Bible says in the book of Jude, because these angels went after strange flesh, and he compares what their sin was to the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, homosexuality, because they also went after strange flesh. So he makes the comparison of what the angels did versus what they did. And then he says, because they left their proper abode, he has put them in great chains, according to Peter, in darkness. And that place is called um, oh, I just, it was right there in my mind, and it slipped my mind. To Tartus. To Tartus was a place where they're in chains. They're waiting for the great day of judgment. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. Amen? So there's some, because of what they did, are bound up in chains right now. So, we praise God that his demons don't outnumber the holy angels. Amen? Yes, indeed. Now, Satan has a will. He does. He has the ability to will. He directs his will in the areas that will fulfill his desires. Satan chose to tempt Christ. You have to have a will to be able to do that. He has the ability to communicate because he also communicated with Christ. So Satan is a person. He's a real personage, if you will. You see, a lot of people want to say that evil is some abstract idea, something or something that's out there that people do. No, Satan is evil personified. In fact, in 1 John chapter 5, where the Bible says the evil one doesn't touch you, when you look at the word evil one, it literally means that Satan is completely and totally 100% corrupt. In other words, sin, if sin was a flower, Satan would be the full open blossom of that sin. He is the full version of sin to every form, to its greatest extent. Everything in him is evil. His whole soul, his whole being is completely and utterly and totally and eternally corrupt. Wow. He's the dark one. Amen? Boy, he is. He has the ability to plan. One of the characteristics of a personhood is the ability to plan or scheme. Boy, we see him doing that. In fact, 2 Corinthians 11.3 says this, I fear, least by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his craftiness, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Boy, he has the ability to plan and plot 
and scheme. Satan has a will. He can communicate. He is a person. He also has liability. According to Genesis 3.15, Romans 16.20, Revelation 20, verse 10, Satan is going to meet God in judgment. And God is going to judge Satan and cast him alive into the lake of fire. So Satan is also liable and accountable to the Lord. Animals are not. If an animal kills somebody, they don't bring them to court. They don't try an animal because an animal doesn't have a will. That's accountable to God. It's liable to God. Amen? But it's the person that owns that animal that's accountable to society and to the Lord. Amen? Boy, he also has attainability. He possesses names. Personal pronouns are used to describe him. And a lot of people think that, you know, as I've already said, evil is some abstract idea. No, he's a person and his name is Satan. Well, it's 7 o'clock. I, I hate to cut this off, but boy. Anyway. Next Sunday night, we're going to go through some of his titles. We're going to go through some of his names and what, what they mean. And we're also going to look at uh, what God says about Satan from Ezekiel. That description of him being a cherubim and all that, we're going to go through that as well. And um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this time that you've given to us. Lord, I just pray now, during this invitation time, that Lord, you'll truly... Make us aware that Satan is alive and well. And that, Lord, he hates us with every fiber of his being. Lord, help us to truly have this message be used to run to you, Lord, our great shepherd, the one that truly does protect us with your rod and your staff, or with your power, with your ability, or with our obedience to you. Lord, I just pray that you'll search our hearts. If there's anything in our hearts or lives that we're being disobedient, that you're not pleased with, Lord, I just pray that we'll take this moment, this next few moments, and that, Lord, you'll allow your Holy Spirit to be a spotlight in our heart. Is there anything in your life right now that Satan can use to get a foothold into your life? Is there anything that you have in your refrigerator that God wouldn't be pleased with? Is there anything in your room or that room with a computer in it that God wouldn't be pleased with that might be on that hard drive? Is there anything in your life the way you talk to people, the way you talk to your spouse, any unforgiveness or bitterness or anger in your heart. The Bible says an anger is a foothold that Satan can use to get into your life. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. At least Satan get a foothold. Is there anyone that needs to be forgiven? Remember, the Bible says that God has forgiven you in Christ Jesus of all your sins and that we also need to be forgiven towards other people. If we don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will our Heavenly Father forgive us our trespasses, according to Matthew. Anything you're watching, anything you've been reading, how's your thought life? How do you think about people? The Bible says you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. If you're thinking wrong about people, the evil, about people, Proverbs says that the thinking of folly is sin. And if you're thinking about people in a wrong way, then you're not loving God with all your mind. And the Bible says that wrong thinking is sin. The whole world was flooded because their thinking was evil continually. Ask God to search your heart. Or is there anything in my life that would give Satan an advantage? God's revealed to you anything. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9 that if we confess our sins, John including himself in that, the Apostle John, if we confess, if we say the same thing God does about our sin, that's what the word confess means, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And he wants you to walk out of here with a clean slate. He wants you to walk close to him. God wants us to be aware that Satan is plotting and scheming against us to, help, to ruin our testimony for those of us that know the Lord Jesus Christ. So take a moment and ask God just to refresh your mind, to protect you, to help you be submissive to his will, to be sensitive to his will, to his word, to his spirit. If there's anyone here that's lost tonight that does not know the Lord Jesus as their Savior and Lord, 
God has convicted you and has spoken to your heart that you need to repent of your sin, be willing to stop sinning and turn from self and turn to Him and trust in Him completely, His finished work on the cross and the fact that He was raised from the dead. Would there be anybody that would say, Brother Dave, I, I believe that God is speaking to my heart and telling me I'm lost and I need to be saved and I need to repent of my sin tonight. No one looking around to simply raise your hand. You say, Brother Dave, I, I believe that God is telling me I'm lost and I need to be saved. All right, Christian. Brother George, I'm going to just let you feel led of the Spirit to close this service. Take a moment. Just thank God for His love and His protection.